Hello, wrestling fans. Here we are again, Tales of the Territories. Today we're going to talk about the Central States Territory. The heavyweight champion is here with me at ringside, and Bob is matching. The Central States Territory was headquartered in Kansas City, and so they wrestled in uh, all the way up through Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska. It was a, a Midwest, the Midwestern thing. Let's just put it that way. At this time, now I'm talking about 1987. When I went there, they had lost their powerful St. Louis TV. St. Louis was the best drawing town they had there. Of crowds, sometimes 18,000 people to Checkerdome. But anyway, that, that was gone. The owner of that was the great Bob Geigel. Bob Geigel was president of the NWA for years and years. I guess he did a job or they wouldn't have kept, they wouldn't have kept uh, voting him in there. Anyway, let's be talking about some of the players of the Kansas City Territory. Number one on the area, the man had been there the longest time, the legendary Bulldog Bob Brown. Bulldog Bob Brown was famous for a lot of things. Number one was we, he had... The crew cut haircut. He was usually a bad guy, but when he got up against me, all of a sudden the people loved the bulldog. Fans there are used to seeing he's got one thing on his mind, and that's revenge against. And they loved to see him go after me, and they and they loved to see him chase my valet Brenda Britton, and which they, everybody, all the fans called her flea bag. So Bulldog Bob Brown, he was a thorn in my side. I did blind him, though. Got a little re revenge on that. The thing about Bulldog, he had the two Cadillacs. He had the, uh, the white Cadillac, and then he had the one that was brownish, purple, or whatever it was. But he'd, I think he'd save up all of his money and buy the same Cadillacs about every five or seven years from the, the same old woman. So the Bulldog was always famous for his... Uh, for his Cadillacs. Bob Brown now! Look at the so-called living legend of Bob! I'd be in different places with the Bulldog. I was with the Bulldog in the Maritimes. I was with the Bulldog in uh, in Calgary, Kansas. And now here I am with uh, the Bulldog in Kansas City. A couple good wrestlers were the Batten Twins. The Batten Twins, uh, Brad and Bart Batten. I met them the first night I ever wrestled in Oak Hill, West Virginia. And there they were wrestling themselves, and they both they both were mass wrestlers. I met the Batten Twins in Oak Hill, West Virginia, the first time I ever I ever had a match in Oak Hill, West Virginia, at the WOAY TV studio. There, uh, me and my buddy Steve Cooper went up there since he was from Seth, West Virginia. We had our first match. I had my first match, and let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it was the the greatest match you didn't want to ever see as I was the most rotten professional wrestler that you would ever see. But then again, if you hadn't been trained and all you had was your Carlin Hildegard stuff, uh, what the hell is it supposed to be expected of you? But the, uh, the Batten twins, when I met them that night, they were both wore hoods because they were identical twins and they wrestled each other. So one, let, let's say one was like, uh, Mr. X and <laughs> one was Mr. Y, but they wrestled each other. And uh, they weren't smart, just like me, so they half killed themselves, beat themselves half to death, and all of a sudden they figured out they loved it and they couldn't wait to come back next week. But anyway, back to the Kansas City Territory. Now, the big star that was coming in when, uh, at, oh, by the way, I just happened to uh, remember that. I was the boss there. I was the booker there. So uh, Geigel would run the matches through me, and I'd say yay or nay. But it was his territory, and he, he knew what he usually wanted. So what the hell? I let him go with the flow. I told him, Bob, I'm, I'm the boss here, but I'm not going to fire anybody. So uh, the people we got here, if, you're, if you want to bring somebody in, go ahead and do whatever you want to. If you want to ask me something, I'll give you my opinion, but, it's your, but you're the one footing the bill, so uh, it's all on you, baby. So now at this time in 1987, Harley Race was no longer there, the legend. Pat O'Connor, who was one-time NWA heavyweight champion, he was no longer there. He had, had retired. Harley, well, Harley was with WWE at the time, and uh, Pat O'Connor had, had retired. 
come in. I was like sort of like the head honcho. Brenda, Brenda Britton, she had her own section of the tape. It was called Brenda's Beauty Shop. That was one of the funniest things I ever saw in my life. I saw the old school book. <laughs> and, and that was a good rib. So some other people coming in and out was the great Bruiser Brody. Bruiser Brody was about, I think everybody knows who Bruiser Brody was, but he was about six foot six, about 285 to 312 pounds, depends how much he ate that, uh, ate that night. But uh, I wrestled him four weeks in a row, and I was the littlest guy there, and it took him four weeks before he finally beat me. Yep, Bruiser, Bruiser Brody, he dropped a big leg on me, and he knocked me half silly. But the reason he beat me is because that six foot five, 320 pound, uh, slick headed, mustachioed, the world's ugliest man, Ox Baker, he shoved me off that turnbuckle, off the top turnbuckle. I took the bump. Brosy hit, hit me with that big leg. And uh, when after Brody left the ring and I realized what happened, I yelled at that big chicken ox baker and told him to get his butt back in here. So I was going to go off and wrestle ox baker for the next four weeks. So and as a matter of fact, as far as drawing, me and, me and Oxy outdrew uh, me and Brody. So you, you, you never know. Ox was huge. He had that great voice. Hell, he was a movie star and escaped from New York. He was an imposing figure with that heart punch, but Geigel didn't like it because he said he could hardly move. Well, hell, when Ox was 25, he was still that tall, that big, and he moved just as slow then. A big guy's not supposed to move fast, but Geigel got mad about that, so Foxy Oxy was out. So Bob Geigel stuck his nose in my business, so I ripped off Bob Geigel's, the clothes he had on and stuff, so I started wrestling Bob Geigel. The first thing Bob Geigel wanted to do, he had to go to St. Joe, Missouri and have his special referee, Sonny Myers. Of course, Sonny had been a referee there for years, had been a carnival wrestler, had been all over the world, trained a whole bunch of guys. He was a great guy putting the ring up. He just loved the professional wrestling business. That, that was uh, Sonny Myers. I'm having a street fight with the promoter, 63 years old, 63 year, years old was Bob Geigel. Blindsided by Hustler Rip Rogers. <laughs> this is legal, Rip Rogers. This is a street thing. And he never blew up in the ring. He was a wrestling machine. I could not believe a man 63 years old could be in that kind of shape. And he whooped my ass all over uh, the St. Joe Civic Center. We was up to the top of the building, down to the basement. Uh, I think we went in the bathrooms, but I think they edited it out and stuff like that. There's a couple couple girls in there going to the bathroom. Or maybe this guy's going to the bathroom. Hell, I can't remember, and I couldn't see that well. But anyway, all that action was taking place in the central states in St. Joe, Missouri that night. Now, when that happened, I know what happened. Brenda sprayed him in the eyes. So Bob Geigel sauntered off into the sunset. And then Sonny Myers' protege, Mike George, the living legend of uh, Central States Wrestling, he actually attacked me. Away from this. And Rip Rogers just blasted Mike George. So I had to fight back. What was I supposed to do? So all of a sudden, we're involved in a big pull apart. Here come the Batten Twins. Here comes Russell Sapp Esquire. Here comes Pork Chop Cash. Here comes Rick McCord. Here comes referee Rick Ashwell. I think the announcer Rick Stewart was going to get involved. The Cuban Assassin uh, runs out. Rufus R. Jones, Mr. Pogo, Vinny Valentino, six foot six WWF superstar later on, the Warlord, uh, Crusher Carl Kovacs, the Hangman Bobby Jaggers. They all come out to separate uh, me and Mike George. So then uh, Mike George pretty much, he says he beat my ass for four weeks, but I don't, I, don't think, I don't think he really did. Now, when Bruiser Brody was there, after he wrestled me, he wrestled uh, uh, Abdul the Butcher. And when you knew when Bruiser Brody came in with Abdul the Butcher, there was going to be action, there was going to be excitement, and there was going to be a lot of blood. And that's exactly what happened in weeks one, two, three, and four. 
as they would be fighting in the building, all over the building. I think they almost went out front. But Abdullah wore those long white tights, and they was a, as Gordon would solely say, his face was that of a crimson mask. And his white, working at the hospital, <laughs> they was, it, it, it was nothing but blood. And Brody with that long hair down to his shoulders and in big old boots and him yelling, huts, 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 huts. He was, he was bloody. They was just, they was just both uh, nothing but a bloodbath. And I was glad to see those two do that, because, but I was just happy as hell that it wasn't me. Brenda, Brenda Britton, my valet, she had her own uh, TV show. Well, insert, whatever you call it. It was called Brenda's Beauty Shop. And the last time I remember being on there, it was me talking in there. It was uh, Pork Chop Cash. It was the Warlord, Crusher Carl Kovacs. And I think Bobby Jagger stuck his nose in there, and, and we beat him up because he, he all of a sudden he turned, uh, as Pez Watley would say, goody two-shoes white boy, and all of a sudden he was a good guy. So we eliminated Bobby Jaggers, and uh, we, were, we were the kings of Brenda's Beauty Shop. Now, Pork, the pork Chop Cash, he was involved in a uh, a pretty good feud with uh with rufus r jones pork chop cash pork chop cash is stupid pork chop cash is a hillbilly rufus had had almost homesteaded there in kansas city for a long time and he'd worked uh down south he'd worked a lot in north carolina but Lu but rufus he loved it there in Now, on the, uh, the Japanese side of town, let's just put it that way. Uh, let's just put it that way when uh, they had Mr. Pogo was there, as I always called him, as he would ride me in the van a lot of times, the mysterious Mr. Pogo. Uh, I was also in Puerto Rico with Mr. Pogo. But Mr. Pogo was famous for taking about one-hour showers. I could not believe it. And what I did was one time... I actually, me and Pork Chop Cash got in the van and we left. And Pork Chops wanted to get some beer. And we come back and we thought we'd rib Mr. Pogo that, that we were gone, that we were late. And know what happened? Hell, he was still soaped up. Uh, the little little Japanese little tickler there was, uh, was, uh, was all soaped up and everything. And hell, he was still in the shower for another half hour. So the rib... We thought we was going to rib him, that he'd be worried that he lost his ride. And hell, we had to wait even longer, and he ribbed us by staying in the shower even longer. And he was one of the first Japanese uh, I ever heard sing in the shower. And I don't want to repeat it because I can't sing, but let's, I, just, I just shook my head. Oh, another guy, uh, important, the important cog of the wheel, was Akio Sato. Akio Sato was he was like the American agent for Giant Baba. So uh, when I was uh, working there, he gave me my first contract to go work for Baba in Japan, for uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling. And then we was working out the gym one day. It was me and Sato and I think Pork Chop and a couple other guys. All of a sudden, Sato gets a phone call. There was a big crash. There was an airplane crash. One of the Japanese boys had broken in in the business, and he was a rookie, and he had gotten married, and he had a plane crash. And he was supposed to be going to South Africa in December. So to make a long story short, when Sato found out about that, he asked me if I wanted to go over there to South Africa and... Uh, take the guy's place because they needed to get the paperwork started going and uh, my passport, the working papers, et cetera, like that. So I said, I had a chance to go over to uh, South Africa for three weeks. Hell yes, I was going to go. So when I went over to South Africa, that'll be a, a, a new episode that we'll be talking about. When, when Sato's around, things happen. Thanksgiving night was always about the biggest night in wrestling in the territory days thanksgiving night and christmas night and on thanksgiving we had a we had a hell of a house now bob geigel had sold his 
territory, at least he thought he did, uh, it was either to Vince or Crockett, but either way, they only made one payment or didn't make a payment, so he started up again running on his own. Now, looking at my, my notes here, I just remember that I didn't say anything about Anthony Earthquake Ferris. Anthony Earthquake Ferris, I had him doing a bodybuilding gimmick, a posing gimmick, but the thing was he was about 400 pounds, so it was a little bit of a ribbage on that. Just like Russell Sapp Esquire, he, uh, he would come out to the sharp-dressed man. We went out and got him a $10 suit, and his, his slick come up to his sleeves, and his pants come up to his, his ankles there, and he'd come out to the music, sharp-dressed man. And he'd been working on the ring crew for a year, and everybody knew who he was. But all of a sudden, Russell Sapp Esquire, he had that big loaded elbow pad, and he became one badass you-know-what. Now, all this time, Geigel's, uh, let's just say, and he's fallen behind in bills and payments and stuff. So he would take in some business partners for a little bit, uh, but he was running out of money. So I told him, I said, now, Bob, he was bouncing checks. I think Russell Sapp had like 21 checks he kept in his billfold just to remember, just to, remember to, to give them to Bob that Bob would take care of. So I told Bob at, on the Thanksgiving show, he's, he had a, a hell, hell of a house. And I said, well, okay, you owe me last week's pay. So I said, either pay me tonight or I'm out of here. So uh, to make a long story short, Bob went to the box office, settled up. All of a sudden, he was nowhere to be found. We had a show we were supposed to make the next day, so he's waiting on me. He calls me. I said, he says, where are you? I said, oh, hell no. You, uh, you ran out the back door with all the money. I told you if you didn't, I'd be, I'd be getting the hell out of there. So about uh, eight hours later, I was sitting in my house in, in Seymour, Indiana, and I don't know what happened to Bob. The, the the territory and the and the rest of the guys i know i was out of there i know Bre uh, brenda was out of there the old orange van was out of there snuggles my dog he he was out of there and uh all he had to do was uh pay me but since he tried to shortchange me uh had to get the hell out of there in the meantime i don't know if i uh, mentioned rick mccord but rick mccord was a top hand there a good wrestler and Rick McCord is now the owner of a big limousine service. It's in uh, North or South Carolina, I think, or maybe Virginia. Anyway, it's around the, uh, uh, where, where Crockett's territory was. So Rick McCord, he's a very, very, very successful businessman. He's still wrestling. I always see him at the convention. He, we're always telling stories. We're laughing. And as a rib... I used to have a girlfriend, and she'd call him, uh, his name was McCord, but she'd call him McCoy or McCormick because she couldn't remember his name. Now, Kansas City's famous for one thing, and this is some of the things you're not supposed to talk about, so I'm going to talk about them. That's when we had, oh, Rick Stewart. Now, Rick Stewart was the announcer. Now, he was the announcer under Charlie Platt when he was working for Ron Fuller earlier, and he was a, he was a great announcer. You know, Rick Stewart, Bulldog Bob Brown, the living legend of all-star wrestling, he's held about every belt imaginable except. And let's just say he liked to ha hang out at the, uh, he liked to be out late at night. And then Rick Ashwell, he come in and he liked to hang out late at night. Anyway, to make a long story short, these guys like to dress effeminately, talk effeminately, and just be effeminate. And which, since I was a, a master blaster stud, I didn't really run around with him, but, but what the hell, right? Vinny Valentino was there, the high-flying, back-flipping boy. I told you Warlord was there, these 24-inch biceps. Carl Stiles, who was Crusher Kovacs there, he was there. Uh, Hangman Bobby Jaggers was there, and he turned, he turned good guy. And the, the boss of the bad guys was usually the inevitable pork chop Bobby Cash. So this is a brief synopsis of what was happening in the Kansas City Territory. It was my time. That's right, my time when I was working there. So Harley was gone. Pat O'Connor was gone. They had lost their, their St. Louis TV. Here was Geigel holding on for dear life. And uh, I had a good time there. Had some great matches. I said, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. I got the dots on. I got the...
Ready, baby. We're gonna see it. Let's do it. Right, right now.